to say, pardon. Call him to attention. Bonjour à tous. Alors j'espère que vous avez passé une bonne pause déjeuner. Avant de reprendre cet après-midi euh, et, et les plusieurs tables rondes que nous avons, j'aimerais juste euh, attirer votre attention sur la présence euh, de nos partenaires, car à l'occasion de cette 26e Assemblée Générale, nous avons euh, le privilège de compter sur la participation de euh, plusieurs entreprises euh, qui sont leaders dans le secteur des tech euh, et qui nous font l'honneur d'être ici et qui sont à votre entière disposition pendant tout, tout le long de l'Assemblée Générale pour discuter avec vous de ce sujet euh, important qu'est euh, la relation entre l'enseignement supérieur et les nouvelles technologies. Ils seront euh, là durant toute l'Assemblée Générale pour répondre à vos questions et également vous présenter leurs solutions et leurs outils pour vous accompagner dans votre transition numérique. Euh, nous avons l'honneur d'accueillir l'entreprise Cosmos, qui a un stand euh, au fond de, de la salle. Depuis plus de 15 ans, Cosmos accompagne les acteurs de l'enseignement supérieur et de la formation professionnelle pour la mise en place de solutions digitales, des plus simples aux plus riches, euh, en passant par des portails web, euh, des espaces numériques de travail, mais également des solutions de, de, euh, de portfolio euh, électronique et de portail de ressources. Également, il propose des solutions pour faciliter les inscriptions euh, pour les étudiants. Juste devant, nous avons euh, nos amis de Pixies, s'il vous plaît, qui sont une entreprise italo-franco-libanaise, si je ne me trompe pas. Euh, cette entreprise a pour objectif, à travers sa plateforme, de s'attaquer aux inégalités euh, liées aux problèmes d'orientation que subissent euh, les jeunes et les étudiants dans le système scolaire et universitaire actuel. Euh, en passant de l'autre côté de la salle, vous n'avez pas pu, avec leur grand euh, stand, nous avons nos collègues d'Absco qui euh, ont développé une, une application qui permet de tenir en courant les étudiants en temps réel sur leur téléphone portable euh, pour les informer des dernières modifications des emplois du temps euh, des changements de salle ou des annulations de cours, mais aussi leur donner accès à leurs notes et à des offres de stage. Au milieu de nos collègues de Belgique, euh, l'entreprise WooClap, qui, euh, qui est une plateforme web qui permet de dynamiser les cours euh, grâce à l'utilisation de smartphones euh, en amphithéâtre. Elle est utilisée dans de nombreuses universités pour rendre les cours plus ludiques, plus interactifs et mesurer la compréhension également des étudiants. Euh, L'utilisation d'Absco permet également d'intégrer des outils que nous utilisons tous, comme euh, les PowerPoint, Google Drive ou euh, Keynote. Et enfin, nous avons également la présence de StudyLink, euh, qui permet aux étudiants d'emprunter de l'argent à des particuliers euh, depuis 2016. Et à travers leur site internet, euh, cette, euh, cette entreprise permet de faire le lien entre les prêteurs d'épargne et les étudiants pour faciliter justement le transfert de fonds. Voilà, ils sont là à votre disposition. Vous avez dans votre sac de congressistes eu un petit document qui présente la contribution de ces partenaires à l'Assemblée Générale, que je vous invite à lire. Et également, jeudi matin, nous aurons l'occasion de pouvoir nous aurons l'occasion de pouvoir échanger et discuter avec eux en direct, puisque nous, aurions, nous allons avoir une table ronde sur justement euh, l'innovation, les nouvelles technologies et l'enseignement supérieur. Je vous remercie pour votre attention. Euh, N'hésitez pas à aller les voir. Euh, nous, nous avons la chance d'avoir des partenaires multilingues. Et maintenant, je vais laisser la parole euh, aux intervenants et euh, à la session de cet après-midi. Merci. So thank you, Nicolas. Last year, April 2017, in his TED talk, the Pope uh, quipped, and I quote, how wonderful would it be if the growth of scientific and technological innovation would come, would come along with more equality and social inclusion? How wonderful would it be if solidarity This beautiful and at times inconvenient word, when it's simply reduced to social work 
and became instead the default attitude in political, economic, and scientific choices, as well as in the relationships among individuals, peoples, and countries. Good afternoon, my dear brothers and sisters. We are in the second part of our program this afternoon, and we have five uh, speakers today to share with us how their, uh, how their universities become key players in social transformation. So without much further ado, I would like to introduce to you our first speaker. It's, she's Dr. Lorna Gold, project coordinator. Oh, you're together. Uh, to see Chokare from Maynood. And uh, she's experienced advocacy and research professional with two decades of experience working at a senior level in advocacy leadership and management. And she has an extensive experience on all stages of organization. Advocacy, including awareness raising, public campaigning, research, policy development, and media. And together with her would be the president of our host university, mm -hmm. Professor Michael Mulaney, mm -hmm. the president of St. Patrick's College, who is a graduate of Gregorianum in Rome in 2002, uh, doctor of canon law and with a specialization on rotal jurisprudence. So, Dr. Gold, father. So, uh, friends, uh, delighted to be back. Uh, my job this afternoon is really to, there are three of us are going to present this afternoon. And really under the title we're looking at is the Catholic University's key players at the service of a sustainable environment. And we want to share with you our experience so, uh, of, of turning our, ver this campus, which lovely campus which you were all enjoying these days, uh, to make it more sustainable, uh, environmentally sustainable. And it's under, I just, just uh, maybe put on the slides here first, might help. Mm. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe get it to work next. There we are. So maybe just to, as you know, and I explained yesterday, um, the initiative that we're going to talk about is called the Maynooth Green Campus. And we've been very fortunate that uh, we have been awarded by the, the awarding body on TASHC. The, the, the environmental state environmental body has awarded this campus the green flag. So we're very proud to, uh, I suppose, share our experience that uh, enabled us to uh, achieve such a, a worthy and uh, such a fine uh, recognition. So it was an important issue. The Maynooth Green Campus was an important initiative for a more sustainable campus. And I'm going to be joined by Dr. Lorna Gold, as you've already heard, and Dr. And Dr. Joe Larragy of Maynooth University, a lecturer in social policy. And it's important that the three of us present this because this is, was uniquely involves a partnership of three stakeholders. That's St. Patrick's College Maynooth, which is hosting this assembly. Maynooth University, who share the campus with us, and Trocra, which is Caritas Ireland. Uh, so we have, uh, and in that regard, so we've worked together for the last number of years uh, to achieve the Green Campus uh, uh, Award. Uh, and I suppose working together, uh, we have, um, there's a number of challenges that we, that we were facing with that when we started out. Uh, the challenges have been one of the, as you can see from the images and the buildings around the North and South Campus, being an old and new campus present a, a lot of uh, challenges for us. Um, so over the last five years when the project was underway. Um, but it's also, I suppose the other thing is even though it's an old and new campus, it also had a very variable kind of ecosystem uh, between the different uh, places. Uh, so they presented various challenges and opportunities in relation to environmental su sustainability. But sharing the same campus to our strength also was the fact that we share a lot of the services, uh, and, uh, such as the estates and campus services, energy management, and grounds department. So the partnership was also between the three of us was a logical approach to the work that is undertaken on several fronts, and we're very key, and we were very keen to play our part with the others. 
The other, I suppose, factor was that we were also one of the fastest growing, the Maynooth University was one of the fastest growing universities uh, in the country. It's a young university in many ways, even though it was incubated really uh, in St. Patrick's College at one stage, but in many, it's only 21 years old, uh, with rapid student expansion. However, it's also one of the most socio-economically inclusive uh, universities. Uh, so it was it's an exciting place to be at the same time. So the other reason why we, the other feature was this was, uh, was the, um, was the, uh, we're a learning institution, so that reached us out to wider communities, so in Ireland and internationally. So we're aware of the vital uh, urgency in addressing environmental issues, not solely in our planning and day-to-day -day practice, but also more importantly in making a contribution to society through our work, uh, the work of our scholars uh, in teaching, research, and engagement with the wider community. Uh, and also the fact that we have not only a national university, a state university, but we have a pontifical university, uh, which offers modules in climate change and Laudato Si, that gave a, a theological context uh, for looking at this issue. As a seminary, we have a great responsibility in forming future, uh, not priests, but also in the pontifical un university, uh, lay people who will work in parishes, mm -hmm. who will also be great, we hope, uh, messengers, evangel evangelizers, uh, in the, with the message of Laudato Si. Uh, so the Catholic Church and indeed all faith organizations are hugely important to bringing people together at a global and local level and Maynooth is playing its part. And also through uh, Dr. Lorna Gold, uh, who is also very much a, a climate activist, uh, we were able to have a major conference here in 2015 with Trocra, St. Patrick's College Maynooth and Maynooth University, again which highlighted uh, it was a very successful conference on climate justice from evidence to action, which drew up to about 400 participants uh, to the campus in June of 2015, uh, and also has been followed up, as Dr. Lorna Gold will explain in her part of the presentation, in a significant uh, uh, piece of legislation, uh, which began uh, as a result of that conference and actually was passed by our parliament only just shortly, and Lorna will speak about that. So it's really my job just to set the context uh, and Dr. Joel Larragui and Dr. Lorna Gold will now present the, more, the detail of our project. So. So thank you, uh, Father Michael, and um, thank you for the, the invitation and the honor of speaking at this very important conference of Catholic universities. Um, the theme of this afternoon is partnership, and I want to talk about what has been a very significant partnership that I've been part of over the last five years. It's a partnership of three, St. Patrick's College Maynooth, Maynooth University and Trocra, which has its headquarters on the campus here and has a staff of about 100 people. Um, so about five years ago, we decided to uh, set up this committee. Initially, it wasn't a committee about the environment. It was actually a committee to see if we could improve social spaces for staff on the campus. <laughs> but we turned the terms of reference on their head and ask, well, what were we doing to the environment? And uh, maybe we can address the issue of our social spaces in the context of examining our own footprint. And that was really the beginning of what became Maynooth Green Campus. And um, we have a slogan which is greening the campus for a sustainable world. Um, but we operate within a program that operates internationally. So this, um, uh, concept of eco-campus or green campus as we call it is works according to a template that has been developed with considerable influence by the Irish organization on Tashka which was mentioned but also through the international body the foundation on environmental education essentially there are seven steps I'm going to talk about these briefly and there are five themes 
but we, of course, in Maynooth have to do things differently, so we added a sixth theme. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about the organization of Maynooth Green Campus, how we work, and what may be special about the way we do things here in Maynooth. And I want to talk about links to learning and maybe some short reflections on the experience we've had. I also have a section on achievements, but I don't think I'm going to have time to talk about the achievements. Maybe it'll come up in the questions, because um, I know we're short of, of time for presentations. So, um, in April of this year, we uh, very, um, uh, were very proud to be awarded the prestigious green flag which is uh, awarded by the Foundation for Environmental Education. Um, and we were awarded the flag under every theme that we can submit an application under. So that means biodiversity, energy, waste, water, travel, and transport. But we added another theme, which is climate justice. And for those of us who were involved in Maynooth Green Campus, it seemed important, fundamental, to have climate justice there as a theme. It's like the sheet anchor for the whole project. It's what makes the connection between the global and the local happen. So the Foundation for Environmental Education operates internationally since about 2003. Its headquarters is in Copenhagen. And it is responsible for the um, Eco Campus program. And the first university in the world to receive the green flag or the Eco Campus flag was University College Cork, which is another Irish university. Um, in the Irish case, Antashka operates the program on behalf of the foundation. And we were awarded the flag, as I say, in April of this year. So we registered in 2013, and we adopted the template which is used by uh, campuses in Ireland and around the world, um, which involves seven steps, a partnership approach, a range of five themes, although in our case it's six. And after that, really, it's up to us. There's a great deal of flexibility in how you do Green Campus. Some universities have relied on their estates department. In our case, we've adopted a different approach. It's much more citizen-led, and the development of campus citizenship has been the driving force, and I would say the key distinguishing factor in, in the case of Maynooth. So what are the, the steps? First of all, you set up a committee. You conduct an environmental review. You see what you're doing on waste, water, energy, and other themes. Then you develop an action plan. Over time, you try to implement the action plan, and you monitor and evaluate progress. Sometimes you won't make progress in areas where there are great difficulties, but it's still important to monitor uh, what's going on and, and keep the data. Then to develop links to learning. So, um, link what we're doing as a committee on the campus to what's on the curriculum and what's going on in terms of research and public engagement. To inform and involve the campus community and the wider community and to adopt a, a green charter. In other words, a statement of principles and objectives uh, which are guiding, guiding uh, principles for, the, for the, the, the campus. So what are the five themes that we have? Um, biodiversity was an obvious one for Maynooth. It's such a beautiful campus. There's so much biodiversity around here. And um, we have many people doing research on environmental themes. We have a, a very strong research center on bees and pollination currently. And um, uh, they uh, are um, contributing greatly to the work on biodiversity. Energy, of course. Uh, electricity is, is a huge uh, a factor in things like global warming. Travel and transport, similarly, is another theme. Water and how we use it and how much of it we use and how much of it we waste is another very important issue and how do we manage that. Waste itself, 
the amount of refuse produced by a growing campus um, with over 10,000 students, you can imagine uh, there's a lot of waste there. So how do we reduce that? How do we recycle more of it? And finally, the theme that we added in ourselves, and which is such a central theme for us, uh, climate justice, and very much a focal part of the partnership. So this is our first committee back in 2012, 2013, um, and there's a mixture there of academics and uh, students and um, other people from, um, from other departments in the university. I want to show you here, um, they call this an organigram. It's essentially a diagram of how we fit into the campus as a committee. So in the middle here is the Maynooth Green Campus Committee. Um, and uh, essentially there are uh, five uh, themes which we have here. And we set up working groups for each of these themes. So we could have a committee which was talking about everything. And the committee has met quite regularly over time. But it's the working groups that take ownership of a particular area and get moving with it. So whether it's waste or water, they come up with ideas and try to implement them. There's a committee structure. Um, some of these roles have developed over time. Um, we need to develop our communications. Um, I'll admit that we're, the, we're, the, we're very good at doing th good things, but we're not very good at publicizing the good things that we do. So we need to work on that. Um, the committee membership is representative of uh, all of the, the three partners, um, the different technical people around the campus, uh, the different uh, management people, and uh, academic and administrative staff. We connect through the committee to all of the faculties, so we give a report to every faculty meeting on the work of Green Campus, and we have three faculties in Maynooth University. So there's social sciences, arts, uh, philosophy and Celtic studies and science and engineering. So every time there's a faculty meeting, they get a report from Green Campus. It's usually the last item on the agenda. Actually, it's always the last item on the agenda, but it usually sends people away with a pep in their step because there's usually something positive uh, to report from Green Campus. We also link to the students, and we connect right up through the various um, governance structures within Maynooth University, and we have direct links to the chief executives of the three uh, um, uh, partners. And also, we have links to um, the wider uh, community through the local town here, the Maynooth Tidy Town um, Committee, um, businesses <coughs> in the area such as Intel, Antashka nationally, and also not mentioned here is the um, Kildare County Council, the local authority. So we do a lot of work reaching out um, uh, to them. So this is essentially um, the structure um, of, the, of the committee. And you can see that the basic model isn't driven by the Estates Department. Essentially, it's a voluntary committee of people. And our committee meetings usually would have between uh, 10 and 20 people at every meeting. So there's a great sort of um, willingness to buy in and come up with ideas. And um, in fact, initially, we thought maybe we would have to restrict our activity to certain fields to manage our resources. But in actual fact, we decided to allow uh, ourselves to look at all of the themes and to let the thing grow over time. So we took our time before we applied for the green flag because we wanted to let this thing embed itself. And I think that was one of the things which we were praised for when we were assessed for the green flag. Some other universities were tempted to go straight in, get the flag for one thing, and then try and reboot for the next one. Our approach has been more organic, and uh, I think it has actually um, as, as, as stood the test uh, for that. An awful lot of it is about staff and student engagement. Um, we have uh, participated in spring cleans or litter picks. We've um, done um, a little demonstration here using the, the letters Maynooth MU, Maynooth University, uh, with the, the students here. We have organized uh, promotions for walking. And um, down on the, this corner here, um, there's an initiative which is, uh, we support in the Philippines, a graduate of the university, Helen Mitchell. She's a community worker. And in the wake of Mount Pinatubo, uh, populations were displaced and they established an initiative called Wow Bags, or Wonders of Waste, or Women of Wenceslau. And this promotion 
uh, it, essentially it's upcycling of juice packs uh, which are uh, collected in hospitals and various other places in the Philippines and they are washed, stitched together and transformed into those beautiful uh, briefcases, shopping bags, pencil cases and what have you and uh, we promote these whenever we, I'm sorry that I don't have one to show you at the moment, they're, they're very good and they're, very, uh, they're actually also very hard wearing. Okay, so the other thing that we try to do is develop links to learning. And um, the links to learning are, I can only just illustrate these with some, some brief examples. In the case of St. Patrick's College here, we have theologians, um, Suzanne Mulligan, Dr. Padre Corkery teaching uh, moral theology, and they have developed uh, a specialist interest in climate justice and ecology. In the area of social policy, Lorna here has actually devised a new module which is taught in the social science degree on environment, sustainability and social justice. Similarly, in sociology, there are courses on uh, ecology and society. We actually have a wide range of activities going on all of the time, uh, in particular making use of the campus as a site. We have a lot of educational activities. For example, we've had bio blitzes where we try to find out how many different species there are on the campus, and that's excluding the staff and the students. We're talking about flora and fauna around about. Um, and um, we've participated in those uh, initiatives. Um, and we're developing our knowledge of biodiversity on the campus. So we're developing an app at the moment so people will be able to know what tree they're looking at, uh, what's going on around them in the environment, and to make them more generally aware. Uh, we've had guest speakers, climatologists from the UK and internationally giving seminars from time to time. We have um, uh, 60 bird boxes have been put up all over the campus in order to, to promote nesting by birds. We also have promoted <coughs> bat nesting with bat boxes. Um, and. Um, this is, the, uh, this is the rooftop of the education building just across the road here, and on the rooftop they have a garden. So this education building, they're training primary school teachers, and they have a garden on the roof, and they show the students how to grow radishes and herbs and various things like this. And of course, the campus as a whole, being a biodiverse site, is a, a, provides a wonderful parkland and an opportunity to educate future primary teachers who will take that knowledge to the next generation. So these are just some examples. So Frebel, geography, biology, uh, great things going on in all of these areas. We are very uh, fortunate to have on the campus some of the world's best experts on climate change. Uh, Professor John Sweeney was a co-recipient of the uh, Nobel Prize in 2007 for the work of the uh, um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, Professor Peter Thorne here is going to lead the physical science report in the next round of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So he will be editing and reviewing all of the physical science research produced across the globe for the next report. Uh, we have other scientists here working on hydroclimatology, paleoclimatology, and we also have um, experience of um, working with universities in uh, Zambia and Malawi, uh, developing a master's program for civil servants on climate change. Um, and these are just examples of the diverse range of um, research and teaching uh, expertise that we have. These are again more people involved in activities. Um, this is um, Jim Carlin who heads up research on uh, bees. Uh, our photographer, uh, Students' Union, there's Lorna. Um, our secretary, Dorina Bishop. Um, she's not actually a bishop. Uh, um, and then we have other staff here. This is, um, uh, this is Kieran Coffey, who is our expert in um, energy. And uh, so we have um, really uh, a lot of very diverse people, and they all work together. And there's a very good uh, atmosphere. So one of the steps that we have to take as part of the Green Campus Initiative is to develop a green charter. And this green charter is only as good as, as it is. It's very much our effort. It hasn't been, uh, it's not set in stone, but it works for us. 
Um, essentially, we want to promote environmental sustainability and climate justice. We want to bring out the global significance of local action. And we want to promote a wide range of activities to that end. In Maynooth, we have a special emphasis on climate justice. Uh, we regard climate justice as a key issue because it is the wealthiest countries and the wealthiest people who produce the most amount of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and it is the poorest people in the poorest countries who suffer the worst effects of global warming. We uh, also want to develop our engagement with the Global Goals for Sustainable Development, or the Sustainable Development Goals, and um, what's wonderful about these goals is that they combine social and environmental uh, uh, challenges. And um, we want to encourage uh, and support uh, action by students and staff and work in alliance with the wider community. So that's essentially what we, what we do. Um, finally, just a couple of reflections about the university uh, and, um, and the environment. Um, universities are exciting places. Um, you can do wonderful things in a university on a campus. Um, uh, they are places where there are ideas. They are places where you can connect the global uh, to the local. Um, we can do a great deal in relation to things like environmental justice because we can link the social sciences and the physical sciences and we can develop public engagement around these. And this is really the key to awareness and motivation. It's focusing on the justice issues is really at the very core of getting anything seriously done about climate change or indeed any other major environmental challenge today. So we want to mainstream sustainability into the campus, into the curriculum, into what people are teaching. I'm a social scientist. I'm not an environmentalist by training. But for me, the social sciences are the areas where climate and environment need to be front and centre in the 21st century. So I'll leave you with that um, uh, final thought. Uh, we, we, the universities are important. They are centres which generate and transmit new knowledge. Uh, they link the global and the local. We produce the next generation of leaders and we are sites for good practice. Sorry for going a bit over there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I'm, I'm just going to speak for a few minutes just to highlight um, the question of climate justice. Why is it that we decided here on campus to focus on climate justice and what the impact of that work has been so far? So, um, TROCRA, which is the Irish Caritas, as Joe has said, is based here on campus. And we also have some of the leading climate scientists based in Maynooth University. So it seemed quite logical for us, given that uh, TROCRA has seen the impacts of climate change on the world's poorest people, at least for the last decade, to focus in on the question of justice and climate change and our responsibilities and to see what we could do here on campus. 2015 was a momentous year. We recognised that quite early on, and we started planning in 2013 to see what we could do around the Sustainable Development Goals, around the, the Paris Agreement, and then when we got news early, very early in the year, that Laudato Si was coming, we decided we would plan a conference to mark the publication of Laudato Si. And we were very fortunate that our conference uh, took place three days after Laudato Si was launched, by coincidence. So this event, um, in the, organized by the three partners in June 2015, was very significant, and I think might be of interest to you. We didn't want to have an academic conference. And right from the very start, when the committee met, we said, <clears throat> we don't want a talk shop. We want something that brings together the science, the evidence, the key players in civil society, and the broader community. So we mobilized at a national level to bring together, to use the, the 
joint partnership of Green Campus to bring together different stakeholders, academics, religious leaders from all different religions, civil society leaders, um, individuals, young people, older people's movements, to have a national, um, a, a, an event of national significance. And indeed, the event itself was significant at a national level. It involved Mrs. Mary Robinson, who you'll, you'll meet on Thursday afternoon, amongst others, Bill McKibben, the vice chair of the IPCC also attended. And the point of them was to understand and to interrogate how we translate the science, the evidence into action of different types. And that uh, event was really the start of a much more um, active citizen mobilization for climate change in Ireland. It was the start of the change of public debate on this important issue. It was the genesis, in fact, of the divestment movement from fossil fuels in Ireland. And as has been mentioned, the, the conference was followed up with another event which was hosted by uh, St. Patrick's College on ethical investments and fossil fuels. And in particular, what are the ethical issues and you might have seen this document it was circulated yesterday and, and there's some copies today, which was the outcome of this seminar in St. Patrick's College and with the Green Campus. The impact of that seminar in February 2016 was the start of a students' movement for climate change, for fossil fuel divestment, and the start of a growing movement for, to change the law in Ireland to exclude fossil fuels from our um, sovereign wealth fund. And that initiative culminated, and also a movement to divest the church from fossil fuels, the Catholic Church in Ireland. Each of these has taken on a momentum of its own. And only two weeks ago, the Irish Parliament voted on the back of a campaign that started in Maynooth to change the law and to put in place a new law and become the first country in the world to divest its sovereign wealth fund from fossil fuels. Our work continues on campus and we really see the significance of building citizenship amongst our students and it's conscientizing students on climate change and climate justice. In February 2016, we held a student summit on climate change and produced some wonderful artwork. This is just the, the wall that was produced on that day, the graphic harvest from, uh, on the theme of saving our common home. We also have various different meetings and opportunities to engage with students. And Joe has already talked about some of the initiatives we have to bring this green campus into learning opportunities. And we link our work on climate justice very much to social justice because they're inseparable. Unless we change our economy and change our models of progress in society, we can't achieve social justice into the future. So from this last year and then this year, we have very much engaged with Social Justice Week and we hope that this will be something that will continue in the future. Thank you very much. Excusez-moi, je, je m'interpose. Normalement, j'étais censé parler après vous, mais malheureusement, je dois vous quitter dans quelques minutes puisque j'ai un avion qui m'attend et mon employeur m'a mal habitué au fait que les horaires étaient respectés. Donc, j'avais pris les timings un peu différemment. Je vais être très très rapide. On m'avait demandé d'évoquer de, les liens éventuels ou pas d'un partenariat avec l'entreprise, université catholique et entreprise. Je veux dire, dans université catholique, il y a université, il y a catholique. Euh, université, on peut dire des choses équivalentes pour toutes les universités, vous les avez évoquées là, on les a évoquées ce matin, euh, ça va, je pense qu'il y a pour moi il y a deux thématiques, en termes, il y a les étudiants, et au niveau des étudiants, ce qui se pratique beaucoup en France et de plus en plus, et qui fonctionne très bien, c'est ce qu'on appelle l'alternance, c'est-à-dire la faculté de faire ses études en partie en entreprise et en partie 
euh, dans l'université ou dans l'école. Et ça, c'est quelque chose qui se pratique de plus en plus et qui est un vrai atout de création de partenariats, puisque vous avez l'étudiant qui va passer soit deux jours par semaine, soit une semaine tous les 15 jours, enfin peu importe, mais en gros un, un mi-temps en entreprise et un mi-temps à l'université ou en école. C'est très formateur, nous en tant qu'employeur, on est très demandeur. Euh, le, le point qu'on pourrait probablement faire progresser sur cet aspect-là, c'est le lien entre le manager de la personne en entreprise et le professeur référent ou l'enseignant référent à l'université. Ces liens-là manquent peut-être un petit peu, mais nous, ça nous apporte beaucoup en termes de meilleure compréhension du fonctionnement en université ou en école, et je pense que l'université, ça donne aussi des éléments sur qu'est-ce qui est attendu en entreprise ou pas. Le deuxième point, c'est la recherche, je l'ai déjà évoqué ce matin. Un des points importants, c'est de dire en quoi les travaux de recherche d'une université peuvent servir l'entreprise, je vous rappelle, peuvent amener des éléments qui vont conforter l'entreprise dans ses choix et qui vont l'amener à faire des, des évolutions et des investissements plus spécifiquement liés euh, au développement durable, à la RSE et, et, et tous les points qui sont en, en lien avec cela. Et ça, ça va être lié à la preuve de la valeur. C'est un mot assez classique en entreprise, la rentabilité, la preuve de la valeur, l'intérêt, même si c'est sur long terme, les entreprises sont capables d'investir sur long terme, mais il faut qu'il y ait des éléments de preuve qui, qui soient derrière. Ça, c'est université. Ensuite, il y a catholique. Euh, est-ce que catholique, ça change quelque chose Est-ce que la RSE catholique, c'est la même que la RSE tout court Est-ce qu'il y a des éléments différenciants Dans le monde français, que certains d'entre vous connaissent bien, qui met la laïcité à un niveau très élevé, ça rend la relation encore plus compliquée. Pour une entreprise comme la mienne, avoir un partenariat avec une université ou un institut catholique, c'est compliqué, puisqu'on va m'accuser, entre guillemets, de sortir de la laïcité. Donc ça donne, alors je connais moins les, les schémas dans d'autres pays, je pense qu'ils sont moins tendus sur ce point-là qu'en France, mais ça me semble un élément intéressant, que ce soit la situation française où ça rend la chose peut-être plus difficile, ou d'autres situations, c'est un élément important à mettre en avant. Pas forcément euh, de, de manière évidemment euh, spécifiquement religieuse euh, ou prosélyte, c'est pas l'enjeu, mais en tout cas de dire qu'est-ce que ça donne comme idée ou comme euh, point de vue différent sur le monde et sur ce, quoi, ce à quoi le monde peut être amené à vivre et, et à faire demain. Et les entreprises sont porteurs de ça, sont souvent demandeurs. Elles ont du mal à le faire. Quand c'est religieux, elles ont du mal à l'accepter par les points que j'ai évoqués, mais ce n'est pas impossible. Dernièrement, dans notre entreprise, on a fait venir un philosophe. Alors évidemment, philosophe, ça passe mieux que théologien, mais ça ne veut pas dire que demain, on ne pourra peut-être pas faire venir un théologien ou plusieurs de plusieurs confessions différentes. Et donc ça, c'est des points aussi, je pense, où les universités catholiques, pour le coup, ont quelque chose à apporter. Voilà, je vous remercie, je fais très court. Merci beaucoup. Merci encore beaucoup de votre invitation et bonne fin de Thank you, Pierre. So we go to the next one. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Ivana Marino, the Vice Rector for Extension and Community Affairs of the University of Faye in San Paulo. And she has been, uh, uh, she has served the university after two years as Dean of the Chemical Engineering course and her uh, involvement in different organizations uh, would certainly help us understand how a university engages with other um, corporations and local partners. Doctor. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us to participate and to share our experience in a, a challenging project that we are developing, that is to prepare students uh, for the development of technology in the context of social responsibility uh, with the partnership of some companies' leaders. And uh, first I will give a context of the institution. FEI is a technological university in Brazil with courses in areas of engineering, computer science, and business. We have around 9,000 students, the most of them engineering and graduation courses. 
And Faye was created in 1941 by a Jesuit priest, uh, Sabaya de Medeiros, with the partnership of business people and executives to meet the challenge of educating professionals for a growing industry. In that time, the in, in Brazilian industry was just starting. FEI was created in Sao Paulo City, and after around 20 years, it was transferred, the, the FEI's engineering courses were, were transferred to São Bernardo do Campo in the neighborhood of Sao Paulo to meet the requirements of an automotive industry implemented in the region. So FEI grew alongside the, the city of São Bernardo do Campo. Uh, San Bernardo was a small city at that time. Uh, the, the automotive industry came to the city. Fay went there at the same, around the same time. Um, and we grew grow to, together with the city. Um, although a technological institution uh, Faye manifests its Catholic and Christian identity, being a center of creativity and transfer of knowledge for a well-being of humanity, uh, pr prioritizing human development, ethics, and citizenship. So Faye has the vision of being an in uh, innovative higher education institute institution, primarily in this, the field of technology and management, recognized nationally and internationally for educating higher qualified professionals and for fostering the generation, dissemination, and transfer of knowledge, thus contributing to a more human and fire society. Uh, but when we think about being innovative, uh, we may think about doing or applying new technology or offer new services. We've been in a world of uh, a very, very high velocity uh, that where the um, technology is changing exponentially. It's not a linear change. Uh, from the, the first uh, uh, car that we have in 1920s, around 1920s, uh, to now, we had uh, regular cars, I use car because it's uh, main curses. Uh, we had uh, the, the same uh, structure of automotive uh, of cars until nowadays. But now we have, let me see if I can, from this car to this, the technology didn't change a lot. But from in the last 10 years, we are put. This is a model of a, a car. I don't know if it's a car because it's flying vehicle, totally, uh, totally autonomous. And it exists. It's not a matter of new. Uh, it's the, the velocity of uh, or the accelerating technology, the, the point. So if you think about being innovative, uh, it's not just new technology or new services. More than that, innovation is about new ways of thinking the complexities of the world and proposing uh, new solutions. If you are living in a moment of accelerating technological changes that bring us some uncertainties, about the future simultaneously. We can foresee many opportunities to learn and search for new solutions for better quality of life. That's our change, uh, challenge. And so we are living uh, with a interesting challenge. That is how to educate people into becoming highly qualified professionals and better human beings, able to be protagonist of, uh, in the high speed disruptive transformation in the society that we are living, 
uh, creative in searching solutions to complex and unstructured issues, still unknown uh, through technology that does not exist yet, uh, and for the better quality of life. It's a challenge, but it's an opportunity. Uh, to meet the vision uh, and challenge of being uh, innovative, we implemented a project called FLEI, FEI Innovation Platform. The Innovation Platform has the aim of leading a cultural and organizational change which will permit to achieve higher level of education and research preparing professionals to be protagonist and creative in the search of new solutions for the future needs of society. Um, our innovation platform has three main pillars. To strengthen face innovation culture, to be aligned with the future mega trends, here we're talking about technology, uh, to offer innovative undergraduate programs. Uh, the idea is inspired, inspired visionary and community. And um, besides the platform, FEI has an uh, innovation agency that is responsible for the interaction with economic and public agents committed to technological innovation. Uh, about research, about uh, service with the industry and, and related. But in the platform, uh, we have our main partnership, that's the theme of the, 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 this, this part of the, the conference. And so we have um, two main paths of governance in the platform. We have exec the executive group, the innovation platform coordination, uh, under the supervision of FACE president that is responsible for the implementation of innovation agenda and process internal procedure, processors and things related. But we have a orientation committee uh, that has some contributions that is, uh, with uh, the, uh, the, the FEI leaders to establishing strategic path for the implementation of the platform guiding the executive group uh, and propose themes and trends, contribute with the vision of future, the opportunity and the risks with the, the, the technology and the, the accelerating technology, referring people to share their own experience and inspire our students uh, as a result. Uh, the members of the orientation committee have been important part, uh, partners in our strategic project, mainly in the discussion of future and mega trends. Uh, the, the orientation committee has the presence or, or is part of the participation of leaders, uh, president, vice presidents, and CIO of great companies in Brazil, international, most of them, uh, as Siemens, <coughs> Bayer, Ford Motor Company, Bosch, Embraer, Embraer is a Brazilian company for the Mac factory of uh, airplanes, McKinsey, Evonik, General Electric, and others uh, are part of the orientation committee, also professors for, from other universities and fields of experience or expertising. For example, we don't have a course in, in, uh, in the area of uh, health, so we need uh, other partners. And some of them are alumni. Um, uh, we 
are living in a world where the technology seems to be developing exponentially, and it's hard to guess what is to come as new technology development, new projects, and new jobs. We have the challenge to prepare students to participate actively in the development of innovative solutions, even if we are not sure what will be the future problems. However, we need to prepare students to act as protagonists in the con construction of the future. Firstly, students need to be prepared to learn continuously and autonomously. And for that, they need to have a solid scientific knowledge. It's not a matter of not teaching them engineering or any ba uh, basic science. But secondly, students need to be aligned with the future trends and aware about their potential and in contributing with science and technology to driving re re regional and world efforts toward a better quality of life for more people. Uh, at this point, the orientation committee of our platform has a strategic contribu contribution sharing their views of future both the ones regarding new solutions or the risks implied in new advances. So, through rich and free discussion between phase leaders and uh, orientation committee, we established the mayor's future mega trends to be explored or discussed between professors, students, and leaders, uh, and company leaders, uh, yearly. So the mega trend that we, we choose now or we establish to work is mobility and connectivity, uh, water and uh, food and safety, uh, energy efficiency, health and well-being technology, sustainable development, manufacture, and intelligent industry and new materials. In order to discuss these trends with the community, including professors and students, we created the FE Innovation Congress Mega Trends to the year of 2050. Um, in this annual event, where, where we invite some important governmental, academic, media, and business leaders to share their perspective and view regarding a specific theme. Um, we selected the theme and we yearly we choose one of them. Uh, in 2016, we talked about uh, uh, innovation, Internet of Things, uh, connecting and mobility. Uh, here, we have here, oh. uh, here we have uh, the participation of uh, the Ministry of Science and Technology uh, in our Congress. In 2017, we have uh, the theme was uh, smart cities and uh, countryside uh, for a better quality of life. Um, we, we share, we have a discussion with leaders and students, um, plenaries and round the tables and a lot of uh, activities. For this next year, uh, or these years, uh, 2018, the theme will be technology for a life with quality beside 100 years old, job, health, and well-being. Uh, in, in this, the 2016 Innovation Congress, it, we had for uh, 46 speakers, two ministers, state ministers, 2,000 participants. And these are companies that uh, share the experience and view with our students. And the aim of the, the Congress is to guide the students to create their own view of future. It is not a technical uh, Congress or a scientific 
we, we don't, uh, it's not a scientific congress or academic congress. It's just to, to guide the student to, to create their own uh, view of future and show them that they can be part of the construction of a better world. Uh, as an outcome of our new position, Faye has been participating or contributing with an important, um, in an important forum with uh, other players as National Federation of Industry, Brazilian Association for Engineering Education, and the, the Minister, uh, Education Ministry to discuss and propose new engineering courses guidelines. Uh, it's expected new engineering graduates to be prepared to meet new technology cha uh, challenges to contribute into Brazilian society, social and economic development. That is our uh, figure of our uh, platform and uh, the, the partnership with the leaders of company has been, uh, has the aim of bring to our students inspiration and uh, about how they can participate in the construction of uh, a better world for all uh, using their er area of knowledge that, that will be or uh, uh, engineering and te technological develop development. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, professors. From science, technology, we move to the perspective of philosophy. Oh, uh, here. No. Science. No. So we have here a physicist and a doctor of theology, director of the Catholic University of Lyon. Uh, Father. Merci beaucoup. Je ne vais pas parler de science aujourd'hui mais davantage de deux expériences, que nous, deux expériences que nous vivons en ce moment dans la métropole de Lyon, qui, au niveau des métropoles, est la deuxième en nombre d'habitants après Paris en France, où, à partir de deux spécialités de recherche, des relations avec la métropole et les acteurs locaux ont été rendues possibles. Le premier exemple tourne autour de l'interreligieux et le deuxième exemple autour de la tradition du catholicisme social qui anime beaucoup de nos universités. Premier exemple, à partir des, du dialogue interreligieux. Nous avons la chance d'avoir depuis longtemps une recherche dans ce domaine, en théologie des religions d'une part et en dialogue islamo-chrétien d'autre part. Et voilà qu'un jour, le recteur de la grande mosquée de Lyon vient me trouver en me disant « Thierry, il y a beaucoup d'imams qui arrivent d'Arabie Saoudite, du Maroc et de beaucoup de pays qui arrivent en France, qui ne connaissent pas le français, qui ne connaissent pas la culture française. Est-ce que vous qui avez l'habitude des liens internationaux et du dialogue interreligieux, vous pourriez nous aider à monter des formations sur l'inculturation dans une société comme la société française laïque, où la laïcité est aussi très forte, comme on l'a rappelé tout à l'heure. Et nous nous sommes dit, oui, ça vaut le coup de répondre à une telle demande sociétale. Donc non seulement nous avons, comme dans beaucoup d'autres endroits, la possibilité d'apprendre le français et la culture française dans un institut de ce type. Mais aussi, nous nous sommes mis avec une université publique. En France, université publique et université catholique ont parfois quelques difficultés à collaborer. Là, nous avons collaboré entre notre faculté de théologie, spécialisée dans la théologie des religions et le dialogue islamo-chrétien, et la faculté de droit d'une université publique. Et nous avons monté une formation droit, religion, laïcité pour les imams qui arrivaient euh, sur la métropole de Lyon. Cela a donné des idées aux préfets de euh, la 
région Rhône-Alpes qui a vu là une opportunité de cohésion sociale et d'inculturation. Et de plus, il s'est dit, et nous nous sommes dit avec lui, que des personnalités, des administrations françaises qui ont l'habitude de travailler avec des personnes venant de l'étranger, mais parfois beaucoup plus de difficultés avec des personnes marquées par l'islam, de suivre aussi une deuxième formation droit, religion, laïcité, en lien avec la première que je viens d'indiquer. Donc, d'un côté, on forme des imams et des responsables musulmans à droit, religion, laïcité. D'autre part, euh, des euh, personnalités euh, du monde administratif, éducatif, de la santé, du social. Et ces deux types de groupes se retrouvent ensemble. Et c'est maintenant la sixième année que de telles formations ont lieu en France. Et je pense que dans un cas comme celui-là, une université catholique avec ses spécialités, notamment dans ce dialogue interreligieux, peut vraiment contribuer modestement, mais de manière extrêmement intéressante, à la cohésion sociale, au dialogue local. Et en plus, des entrepreneurs, lorsqu'ils ont vu ce type de recherche, nous ont dit, comme on l'a entendu tout à l'heure, mais nous, dans l'entreprise, nous avons aussi des questions d'interreligieux. Lorsqu'une entreprise lyonnaise s'implante en Turquie aujourd'hui, avec la moitié du personnel venant de France et l'autre moitié venant de Turquie, des gens marqués par l'islam et qui demandent à faire la prière cinq fois par jour, y compris dans l'entreprise, comment gérer cela Et du coup, c'est une recherche qui se poursuit, qui a commencé dans la métropole de Lyon, et qui aide aussi à sa façon des entrepreneurs de cette métropole euh, qui, vion, qui vont s'installer dans d'autres pays musulmans. Voilà un exemple qui nous semble intéressant et que nos universités catholiques peuvent porter dans ce monde. Un deuxième exemple, plus lié au catholicisme social, qui est une grande tradition qui parcourt un certain nombre de nos régions et de nos pays, euh, C'est une, une action soutenue par l'Europe au sein d'un des quartiers. La métropole de Lyon est une belle métropole très dynamique avec beaucoup de croissance, notamment économique. Mais comme toutes les métropoles, elle a aussi ses zones plus de pauvreté. Et autour de Vaux-en-Velin, qui est un, une de ces zones, il y a une zone où le chômage est particulièrement fort et nous nous sommes connectés avec des associations de quartiers, avec la municipalité, avec des entreprises d'économie sociale et solidaire et nous avons pu embarquer dans nos réseaux qui nous soutiennent des entreprises hors de l'économie sociale et solidaire pour se mettre ensemble et bâtir un projet pour permettre l'emploi, pour permettre en particulier le lien entre les jeunes de ces quartiers défavorisés qui n'ont pas de formation adéquate et les éventuelles embauches possibles par les entreprises de la métropole lyonnaise et les entreprises de ce quartier défavorisé. Et notre objectif, et c'est la troisième année de ce programme, et de monter d'une part des plateformes de rencontres pour cela et surtout d'orienter les jeunes en fonction des besoins des entreprises du coin, les orienter vers les bonnes formations et leur proposer des tremplins sur ce type de formation. Voilà les deux exemples que je voulais présenter ici comme deux exemples possibles d'interaction avec des métropoles, avec le local, avec certainement aussi des ouvertures globales comme celle de l'interreligieux dont j'ai parlé tout à l'heure. Merci. Thank you. So we reserve the last for a philosopher. So Professor Chantal, rector of Saint Paul University in Ottawa. Est-ce que vous m'entendez bien? Est-ce que ça va bien? Vous êtes réveillés? Bon, voilà. Alors, euh, 
Je vais euh, procéder assez euh, rapidement parce que beaucoup de choses euh, ont été dites. Euh, je vais parler d'un projet à l'Université Saint-Paul euh, qui s'inscrit dans la lignée de démarches de réconciliation avec les peuples autochtones du Canada. Euh, nous sommes une vingtaine d'universités euh, catholiques au Canada et euh, nous avons euh, toutes euh, soumis euh, une, une, un projet, plusieurs projets euh, pour répondre euh, à, aux appels euh, à la réconciliation avec les peuples autochtones. Donc, toutes nos universités ont proposé différents projets qui sont très intéressants. Je vais vous parler d'une autre à l'Université Saint-Paul. Nous avons une école de psychothérapie et de spiritualité qui opère depuis 42 ans. Et euh, nous, a, nous avons une clinique de psychothérapie qui offre des services à la communauté. Euh, nous sommes la clinique de psychothérapie la plus importante dans la région de la capitale nationale d'Ottawa. Euh, nous répondons à 12 000 euh, appels euh, par année. Et donc, euh, c'est un endroit pour les étudiants de maîtrise et de doctorat de mettre en pratique euh, leurs euh, habiletés. Et nous avons aussi un programme de maîtrise et de doctorat en psychothérapie. Euh, nous avons euh, reçu une, une demande du gouvernement pour euh, répondre de manière urgente à une crise dans une communauté autochtone euh, au nord de, de la province. Une petite communauté qui euh, euh, vit des crises qui sont liées au traumatisme intergénérationnel causé par euh, les écoles résidentielles et aussi euh, la dépossession culturelle. Euh, ça se manifeste par euh, des suicides, euh, des abus, euh, de l'inceste, euh, des dépendances, euh, mais surtout, euh, ce qui est très triste, euh, des suicides d'enfants. Alors, euh, à certains moments, il y a des enfants qui vont commettre des suicides, la, toute la communauté est en crise. Alors, c'est compliqué au Canada parce que les Autochtones sont soumis à une loi euh, euh, infantilisante par rapport aux communautés autochtones qui font en sorte qu'ils sont soumis à l'autorité du gouvernement fédéral. Et donc, le gouvernement fédéral nous a demandé d'envoyer des, des psychothérapeutes sur place pour aider à résoudre la crise. C'est habituellement la façon dont ils fonctionnent. Malheureusement, c'est une façon qui euh, ne convient pas. Euh, les personnes, euh, les intervenants vont, ils restent là deux semaines, ils repartent, après d'autres viennent. Donc, il n'y a pas de ressources durables, il n'y a pas non plus la possibilité de bâtir euh, la résilience au sein des communautés. Et donc, nous avons refusé de participer à cette demande, mais nous avons fait une contre-proposition au gouvernement en disant que nous aimerions mieux contribuer à la formation des personnes autochtones pour qu'elles euh, deviennent elles-mêmes euh, psychothérapeutes et euh, participent elles-mêmes à la prise en charge de la communauté et à une plus grande résilience. Donc, euh, nous avons pris trois ans à bâtir des liens avec euh, les communautés autochtones, euh, ce qui... Euh, n'est pas une mince affaire, étant donné que nous sommes une université catholique et que notre répondant canonique est une communauté religieuse qui a euh, contribué elle-même euh, à l'administration des écoles résidentielles et qui a aussi été accusée pour des abus commis auprès des personnes autochtones. Alors, pour nous-mêmes aussi, c'était une démarche de réconciliation euh, se rencontrer dans la vérité avec les gens et aussi accepter euh, en toute humilité d'entendre les récriminations et la souffrance des personnes qui ont vécu les abus. Alors, c'était euh, très difficile pour nous, euh, très souffrant aussi pour nous, mais euh, une écoute euh, empathique euh, et qui proscrit euh, la défense euh, des intérêts euh, permet de développer la confiance entre les personnes et c'est à raison de cette confiance qu'on a pu 
euh, établir un partenariat avec un groupe qui couvre 41 communautés euh, et puis un collège donc pré-universitaire euh, autochtone. Et nous avons bâti des passerelles euh, du programme pré-universitaire vers le programme universitaire, mais nous avons surtout conçu le curriculum ensemble et nous avons fait place à l'intérieur de notre curriculum au savoir autochtone. Euh, ce qui n'est pas une mince affaire non plus, ce n'est pas nécessairement gagné d'avance, même si on est une université catholique et qu'on a une faculté de théologie, euh, que nécessairement on est prêt à faire place à des savoirs autochtones, euh, traditionnels, euh, qui ne rencontrent pas nécessairement les normes euh, de la science euh, occidentale. Donc, euh, il faut apprendre à, à faire preuve d'humilité, euh, d'écoute, en fait, c'est de flexibilité, d'agilité, d'ouverture d'esprit, euh, et puis aussi d'être patient, euh, parce que la confiance, ça se bâtit au fur et à mesure. Euh, Ce n'est pas vrai que tout à coup, euh, parce qu'on on veut aider, que tout à coup, les, ça va se faire tout d'un coup. Donc, il faut accepter qu'il y aura des revers, des pas en avant, des pas en arrière. Donc, il faut nous-mêmes faire preuve de résilience également dans tout ça. Donc, euh, je, je ne vous dirai pas tous les détails, mais je peux vous dire que euh, cette collaboration s'avère extrêmement fructueuse et euh, elle a donné lieu à euh, des réponses très, très innovantes aux besoins des communautés parce que ce sont les communautés elles-mêmes qui ont participé à l'élaboration euh, de, de, euh, de ces formations. Donc, il y a une formation, en fait, qui est un, un séjour de répit pour les intervenants qui sont déjà dans les communautés et qui, sont, qui souffrent de burn-out de compassion, euh, à force d'être traumatisés et retraumatisés tout le temps. Donc, euh, ces, ces, ces jours de répit vont se faire sur des thématiques particulières, servent à briser l'isolement des intervenants et euh, servent aussi à les alimenter dans les meilleures pratiques. Autre profil, ce sera des formations additionnelles pour les gens qui ne sont pas des psychothérapeutes, qui travaillent dans les communautés, par exemple les enseignants, les infirmières, euh, ça peut être un travailleur social ou d'autres qui travaillent auprès des gens, pour les habiliter à l'écoute euh, active et la relation d'aide. Et une autre formation qualifiante pour les gens qui ont des formations en travail social ou même en psychologie ou en sciences infirmières, mais qui veulent devenir psychothérapeutes. Et finalement, euh, la dernière formation, la maîtrise en, en counseling, psychothérapie et spiritualité, qui intègre la spiritualité comme levier vers la guérison. Donc, euh, voilà. Et aussi, nous avons fait campagne auprès de nos bienfaiteurs et bienfaitrices pour obtenir des bourses, euh, pour aider les étudiants et les étudiantes à participer parce que, la plupart de ces gens proviennent de communautés très, très éloignées. Euh, juste le déplacement, ça coûte des milliers de dollars. Et donc, euh, euh, nous avons réussi à obtenir un million de dollars en dons pour aider euh, la mobilité et la participation. L'autre chose aussi, c'est que nous avons accepté, et ce n'est pas facile pour plusieurs de nos professeurs et même de nos administrateurs, que la formation soit donnée euh, en équipe aussi dans euh, autre, autre part qu'à l'Université Saint-Paul. Donc, de faire appel à des partenaires euh, dans une ville éloignée du nord de l'Ontario pour que les étudiants puissent être suivis au, sur le plan clinique par des psychologues là-bas, plutôt qu'ils qu viennent sur notre campus tout le temps pour faire les formations parce que de s'éloigner de leur famille et de leur communauté, ça leur cause un stress euh, additionnel dont ils n'ont pas besoin. Donc voilà, c'est terminé pour moi. J'espère que vous allez toujours bien. Bon, Merci. voilà. Merci. Sorry, we are running out of time, so we can only accommodate two questions from the body.
only two questions. If you have none, well, well and good. Oh, there's one from that side. You have the microphone. I have a question for uh, the speaker from Canada. Uh, um, le, 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 oh, sorry, <laughs> I speak Spanish. The, the students participate in any way in this program with native communities? So is the question, are, are the current students participating? Um, so the, the programs, uh, are, are, um, priority is given to indigenous students. Uh, we, we are receiving our first students in the fall. So already the community is sending us a master student. And um, the other students uh, will stay in the northern city and they will participate through online. And uh, so it's, it's a small cohort because we're just starting. But uh, with indigenous communities, and I believe it could be the same with other types of partnerships, if they feel that they, the, they, they own, they have ownership of the program and they really help design the outcomes that they need, they will participate. But often, the, the temptation for universities is to say we know what's best and just to roll out the curriculum on people. And so I think it's, um, it's a very good experience for us to, uh, to learn from other ways of doing things. And uh, I find it very humbling in a good way that uh, they have ways of looking at the world that are very rich, very wholesome, and we have a lot to learn from them. Okay, thank you. One last question. This is a question to the St. Patrick's. Really fascinated by the way in which you had presented the whole thing and feeling a little bit jealous as well. Uh, my question is regarding, is there any element of compulsion or mandatoriness uh, regarding the student involvement and the faculty involvement. Had it been easy for you to get the faculty, the entire lot, involved in the process without making it compulsory for them? Are there additional tasks for the faculty in this process other than the typical teaching, learning, and uh, research uh, components which make them feel uh, either compelled or happy uh, to get involved in the whole process? Thank you. Sorry, um, my hearing is not very good. Um, yeah, so we have tried to involve the faculty and the student body. Um, and the way we have tried to do that is by encouraging them to take ownership of aspects of the process. Um, we didn't set out to make rules for how people should behave. We tried to create an environment where people would make the right decision. So we, in simple things, we try to create um, awareness around, for example, energy consumption. So for example, um, every long weekend or holiday break, we would have a campaign which we call Maynooth Unplugged. Um, and basically this is about taking out the plug or switching off the machines or the chargers. And we simply send an email around the whole campus uh, before these weekends and um, we encourage people to, to do this. And um, we have some evidence that this actually improved, um, reduced the amount of electricity wasted. There's an awful lot of wasted energy. So little things like that, people actually came back and said, oh yeah, that was a very good idea. And um, so we try to do as much of that as we can. Um, in the area of uh, waste, we, um, we have uh, got our caterers to use c 
compostable cups. We use thousands and thousands of, of cups uh, here on the campus, and most paper cups are not recyclable. They combine oil-based products with paper, and they can't be recycled. So we've substituted compostable cups across the campus in most of our catering outlets. And this has been a huge um, um, step in the right direction. And uh, an interesting thing about the compostable cups is that they can be taken from the campus here and ground down in a, a waste uh, processing center in the local county. And we get some of the compost back here on the campus. So there's a little bit of uh, circulation, uh, circular economy going on there. Um, yeah, we have um, uh, different disciplines are more ready to engage with the environment, but we tend to uh, look for opportunities to engage with every discipline. We, we, we will stop at nothing to find an opportunity to promote awareness. We even organized um, in 2015, the year that we mentioned quite a lot about, uh, an eclipse witnessing, the e there was an eclipse of the solar eclipse, and we had people up on the roof of the uh, humanities building uh, uh, with uh, looking and witnessing this uh, event. And it was again to raise awareness of our existence on a planet in a solar system. So we, we have no shame when it comes to being opportunistic about conveying the message. We try not to coerce. We try not to be the Boy Scouts. We try to encourage people, and, um, and it's really the connection with uh, social justice that's the driving force behind this. You know, you appeal to people's idealism, and particularly students. You know, they, they're interested in the big questions. They want to do the right thing. And, you know, if you appeal to that side of them, you will get much more out of them in the long run than if you simply impose a set of rules uh, and, and things like that. So we do have a long way to go, but I think now that we have the flag, we can actually say, right, over the next three years, let's develop policies, let's mainstream, let's take more ownership, let's give more leadership as a university, let's become a model for other universities. And so communicating the message outwards and replicating what wasn't really very difficult to do, in fact, and it was a lot of fun for the people who were involved and a very positive experience too. Uh, and uh, it shows that, you know, uh, whilst we can become very despairing in the face of environmental degradation and climate change, you know, you have to, you have to, you have to foster hope and you have to create opportunities and examples that can encourage other people to, to take ownership of this agenda themselves. Okay, so thank you very much. So we thank the panel for a wonderful discussion. So can we have a few minutes break before we start our second?